we come to the, uh, the 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 fun part of the event, which is which is which is the Barry Jones Award lecture. It's um, it's an award to celebrate the memory of Barry Jones, who was a uh, an academic here at the Open University, and this is an this is an ongoing award every two years to coincide with the ASB conferences, which we which we, which we award. Um, I will hand over now to to John C, who has a very a, a good link to Barry, and uh, will explain a little bit more about the the reasoning for the award, and then we'll also talk to Anne, who is Barry's wife, and then we will come to the presentation itself afterwards. So thank you. Thank you. Let's swap on over. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see so many people here and so many familiar faces. I was Barry's postdoc going back a decade ago. So I started at the OU in 2006, the day after Barry officially retired back in the days when you had to retire when you hit a certain age or else. It was kind of mandated. So he got me as a postdoc the day after he officially retired. And I was incredibly fortunate to work with Barry and work for Barry. He was a fabulous mentor. And as a researcher, he was a very, very gifted researcher. But he did a lot more than that. And I think that's what's fundamental to why we've put together the idea of an award in his memory. So Barry was a gifted researcher, but he was also a fabulous communicator of science. And he viewed it as being very important to not just do research, but to get the message out there, to inspire the next generation, and to make collaborations at work. He was an integral part of getting the Astrobiology Society of Britain up and running, getting the conferences going. And like I say, he was a brilliant communicator, a very gifted person and a fabulous mentor. And it's that mentorship that leads into the idea behind the award. It's fabulous to do something in Barry's memory. But there are many awards out there for researchers purely on the basis of their research that don't really take account of what I think Barry and many others think is one of the most important parts of our role as a scientist which is getting that research and that information out to the public and, like I say, inspiring the next generation. With that in mind, to honour Barry's memory, we came up with the idea of the Barry Jones Award and the Associated Public Lecture, which would reward gifted researchers who also went above and beyond in their efforts to communicate with the wider public to inspire the next generation and really get people involved with what they were passionate about. And you're going to see a talk directly on, along those lines a little bit later on. I think that's probably enough from me. So what I'd like to do now is invite Barry's wife, Anne, to the stage to say a few more words about Barry and tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. And it's lovely to be here again um, in the Open University at this particular um, uh, occasion. So, and it's a real honour to be asked to say a few words as part of this introduction at the um, at this um, second of the Barry Jones Award Lectures. So, the desire to infuse, to inspire, and to teach was always at the heart of Barry's work. Indeed, as you've probably realised, much of his life. And so, his wish was that the work of popularising astronomy should continue after he was gone. And to this end, he left a sum of money to the OU, which has obviously been augmented, and they have wisely used this in conjunction with the ASB to set up this series of lectures and awards. But I thought I'd tell you, like to tell you a few words about Barry as an educator from, from my point of view, really. One of the, uh, his early ventures into teaching was with his younger brother by about eight years who was struggling with his science subjects at school. I think he just changed to a, a new school at, at secondary level. And according to Nigel, during one summer holiday, Barry tried very hard to teach me the basics of physics and chemistry, showing a great deal of patience and devising a suitable course of action. Doesn't actually go on to say whether he followed it. But he does go on to say, later I did enjoy physics O level, but there was no career in that for me. But more fun was the musical guessing game that Barry devised, that they played, just for fun. Barry would play extracts on his violin from famous concerti, and Nigel would have to work out which ones they came from. And now this did have an impact on Nigel's career, but that's another story. After finishing his PhD in solid state physics, Barry took up a post in gamma ray astronomy at Bristol University. This involved flying very large balloons into the upper atmosphere with telescopes attached to collect data. 
um, this was just a few months after we were married, one Sunday afternoon he received a call from an angry farmer in West Wales to say that a telescope descended from the skies. It had cut a huge swathe through his cornfield and dragged a blanket of polythene in its wake. And would we come and do something about it very quickly? Or words to that effect. <laughs> so we... Um, didn't have time to pack bags, we thought we'd be back that evening. But the promise of considerable compensation did sweeten the pill of this angry farmer and the community. And we were in, entertained to a fine farmhouse tea. And the next morning, the Welsh-speaking schoolmistress arrived with all her pupils. And Barry was asked to show the children the telescope and to explain what it was all about. And the teacher, speaking at length in Welsh, extolled the virtues of this fine son of Wales, Barry was Welsh, um, and held him up as an example of what all these children could aspire to if they worked hard at school. We all listened patiently to the, uh, the, 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 the teacher, but actually afterwards, both Barry and I agreed that what the children really wanted was to have some hands-on experience with a telescope and that wonderful field of polythene. Um, Hands-on and rather senses-on experience was certainly something that the public would enjoy when they attended various extramural courses in acoustics. So armed with tape recordings and with various musical instruments and means of generating sounds, and remember this was in the low-tech age of the mid-60s, I would drive with Barry and a thermos of lentil soup down on a Thursday evening down to Taunton from Bristol. And there the students would be immersed in a nature of sound with, surrounded by cymbals and clarinets and Doppler devices and all sorts of things. And it was good for Barry's morale that these students were more receptive and more keen to learn than most of the architects that he taught as a young lecturer in the architecture department at Bristol. They were much more interested in drawing and design and even Barry struggled to raise some enthusiasm with them. However, this was, gave him his teaching credentials, and so with his teaching credentials under his belt, he took up a post working with Tommy Gold at Cornell University. And it was here that Barry really caught the astronomy bug. So, what better place to come than the Open University in the early 1970s? A place where Barry could combine his interest in astronomy with his teaching, with his passion for teaching. And during this time here at the OU, as a lot of you know, all the texts and all the course material were written in-house. I think Barry was held in high regard for the quality of the material he wrote and the courses and exam boards he chaired in physics and astronomy. It was also the heyday of the BBC television programmes here at the Open University. But um, Barry was natural in front of the camera, fluent with his narrative and clear with his demonstrations. I think they often made whole programs in one take. At this time, he started writing books on the solar system and life beyond the solar system, as well as co-authoring a fully illustrated book with Bob Lamborn and Dave Rothery called Images of the Cosmos, which sadly I don't think is used anymore, but it's still a good picture book. Summer schools in those days were an integral part of many of the courses. And it was here that Barry was able to teach and inspire his students face to face. Feedback suggests that he did this rather well, although I gather a certain amount of teaching and learning went on in the bar and on the dance floor at the end of the day. Barry was one of the pioneer researchers into exoplanets, I think, but I haven't, haven't got my facts actually to hand. I think he came on, in on the scene when there were only a handful of these planets identified, and so every single new one was a really exciting discovery probably remember from last year, there are many, many that have been discovered and probably many, many, many more. One of the talks that he gave to schools and ast astronomical societies was on the subject of searching for life beyond the solar system. And having excited his audience with facts and wonders about the possibility of life out there, Barry used to end his lectures with artists' impressions of what life might look like on exoplanets of variable gravity, temperature, and atmosphere. So images of marine type animals floating in a thick atmosphere, or low squat creatures lumbering in low squat vegetation would appear on the screen. And these would send the audience away with the exciting, yet disturbing possibility 
that there might yet be something behind the myth of the little green men. So, whether she will be giving us new insights into these myths, or amazing us with the reality of tiny, viable living cells and other planetary systems, it really is most fitting that Dr. Louisa Preston has agreed to give the second Barry Jones Memorial Lecture this evening. Now, at this point, I was going to hand over her to do the lecture, but we want to be sure that the award that she's getting is not in reward for the lecture, but for the wonderful work that she does in popularizing astronomy. And when I did a, a search on the inter internet and found her web page, which was really very interesting, I scanned down and I saw the title of her book, Goldilocks and the Water Bears. And I thought to myself, goodness, if someone can write a book with a title like that, they must be able to capture and engage their audience. So Louisa, I hope you will accept this award from the group here, and we look forward to your lecture. There was ever a time to feel imposter syndrome, just so you all know, that is right this second. Um, thank you so much. It is an absolute honour to be receiving this. I'm not going to say any more than that because I get the impression from everyone who's told me about Barry that he wouldn't want me to and he'd want me to just shut up and talk about the science. So, this is an outreach talk that I do give quite a few times, um, but I do know that so many of you are at the conference as well, so bear with me and if I get anything wrong, try and heckle at the end. Just wait till the end. So I'm going to talk to you about our search for life in the cosmos. Now, it's probably the only wordy slide, really. And I do say this is what astrobiology is, the proper definition for astrobiology. But I think what's more interesting is to talk about how I view it, what I do in astrobiology, and what many academics in the UK are doing as well. And we're trying to answer three main questions. The first one is, where are we from? So a number of us here are working on trying to figure out if life arose in warm little ponds on the surface of early Earth. Did, they, did life arise around black smoke events on the, surf, or the deep sea? Did it come in as prebiotic molecules on meteorites? Did it come in fully formed on meteorites, as in panspermia? No, just so we all know. No, it didn't happen. We're also trying to answer the questions, are we alone? A real X-Files SETI kind of question. We're trying to figure out what life is out there, what life might look like. Is it intelligent? How would we communicate with it? Would it want to even communicate with us? Are we even intelligent enough to have that conversation? And how are we going to do this? We're also looking at where are we going, which is something we talk about a lot. And it's all the space missions that we're trying to plan, both from orbit, looking for life, and also on the ground. We're also thinking about the future of humanity. How are we going to evolve and change in the future? But also, when are we going to leave Earth? When are we going to go and live on other planets, on other moons? Are we going to find ourselves in a Star Trek future? And how is that going to happen? And there's real science being done to do that. Now, I stole this quote from a colleague of mine who's probably smiling to himself because he knows. And it says that astrobiology is a science that's yet to demonstrate its subject matter even exists which basically means when you work in astrobiology, no one can ever prove you wrong. So it's the perfect science to do. Geology arose to explain the rocks and the minerals and how the earth works. Microbiology to explain the cells that people are seeing down microscopes. But we haven't actually proven that our subject matter and our theories are actually right yet, which, to be honest, is half the fun of doing it. Now, we, we actually spoke earlier on about what is life. So don't worry, Terry, you're not going to hate this slide. When we try and think about finding life elsewhere, we know what life is. We feel it deep inside. I know that these chairs are not alive, but that most of you, if you're awake, are. But that doesn't really help us when we're searching for life. So we can think about what does life actually do? And there are a number of things that we observe nearly all living organisms to do. They eat in one form or another. And if what goes in, what comes out, they excrete. They move, they grow, they respond to changes in their environment, and they maintain a constant internal state. There are obviously exceptions. Responding to changes in its environment, well, a thermostat responds to changes in the environment. I'm grateful for it. I wouldn't say it's a living organism. Maintaining an internal state, your refrigerator does the same thing. NASA 
in all their great wisdom, say that all life reproduces via Darwinian evolution, so survival of the fittest. This is a brilliant explanation. But if you transpose it into space science and going to another world, do we want to get to Mars, see an object that may be living, such as a rock, and sit and wait for it to evolve? Because we all know evolution could take millions, maybe even billions of years to happen. We don't really have the time to do that. We need to see something tangible acting right there and then. I've also put, can non-life mimic life? So obviously, it's a loaded question, because we know that viruses, computer viruses, we wouldn't necessarily say they're living, but they can mimic it. Fire, for example, has all the qualities of a living organism, but something inside us says that it isn't a living organism. So it's never really that cut and dry. So when we're looking for life elsewhere, there's only really one thing we can do, and we can search for life based on the life that we find on Earth. That means carbon-based life, and I'm happy to answer questions and debate the silicon theories at the end. It means using water and energy. So by doing that, we have to ask the questions, what do we observe life on Earth needing? So it needs water, such as a solvent, to basically allow its chemical reactions to happen. Life needs energy to power it, and carbon or food to keep it going. I've thrown in two more things that life needs, and as a geologist, this always comes up. Rock. Life needs some sort of a solid surface to originally get going on. Even if it got going in water, that water has to sit on something. We also think that life needs a world with an atmosphere that can protect it from solar radiation, from incoming projectiles, and can keep the surface of that world at the right pressure so that water itself can be stable. And we just happen on planet Earth to be in the perfect place for that to happen. And we call this the Goldilocks zone, which I know I've coined and mentioned too many times, um, but probably the habitable zone. And it's found pretty much with Earth in the centre. Mars is right on the edge and Venus is just outside. Now, in a very basic way, we could split the solar system in half looking at a habitable zone to say that any life we might be looking at, regardless of solar system, if it's inside of this habitable zone, is going to be hotter. The planet or the moon is going to be hotter. That means this world is not going to have liquid water. It will have evaporated. So it'll be a dry world, a dry, hot world. You go further out and further away, the water will be frozen. So therefore, it's going to be a cold world. Still very dry, but cold. You've got to try and think about the different types of life that could survive outside of this perfect spot that the Earth is in. So in this perfect Goldilocks zone, we have two habitable worlds. And we now know that Mars technically was habitable, thanks to us finding carbon-based compounds on it. And there are actually two inhabited worlds, so Earth and Mars. One is inhabited with intelligent beings. The other one is inhabited with robots. I'll leave it to you to say which one you think might be which. But our traditional view of the habitable zone, of the Goldilocks zone, is changing. It's not just a single band in a solar system where anything is possible. There are many habitable zones throughout a solar system, and many of those are found to be circling the planets themselves. And so once we started to see all these different things, we realized that actually looking out towards the gas giants was a really good place to look. And actually the gas giants themselves, they're not that interesting, at least not in terms of astrobiology, but the moons around them are proving to be really exciting. So I've just chosen ones that either I find really exciting or the press and the media and the world seem to find exciting as well. So the top one is Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn. Enceladus, in the last couple of years, has proven itself to basically overtake Titan in my estimations, because Titan's always been my favourite. Enceladus is an ice-covered world that has jets exploding from its south pole. These jets are about the size of the distance of London to Paris. That's how far out they go. They f they're flying out icy particles, water, carbon-based molecules. Lots of this rains back down onto Enceladus's snow, and the rest of it actually goes to form the E-ring of Saturn. Now, this tells us some major crucial things about Enceladus. One, that there is an ocean down there because there is water being erupted. Two, that there is energy because the eruptions have to be powered by something. And then when Cassini flew through the jets and it found these carbon molecules such as carbon dioxide and methane, we now know that there are carbon-based organic molecules there too. 
So the three main things needed for life in our very basic, I appreciate, understanding exist on Enceladus. The next world that's really interesting is Titan. I have always said that if I was ever going to get stranded somewhere in the solar system, Titan was where I wanted to end up. Because it actually reminds us a lot of the Earth. It has lakes and seas, it has weather, it has mountains, it has dunes. It's an adventurous paradise. But everything is made from a slightly different chemistry to that which we're used to. The lakes and seas are not made of water. They're made of liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. It rains like a tarry smog. The dunes are made up of bits of broken ice and water, not necessarily silicate rocks like we have on the Earth. The reason I think Titan's so awesome is because it has a really thick atmosphere. So if you were going to get stranded there, you couldn't breathe, don't get excited, but you could take a pretty good run up, strap on a pair of wings and fly quite easily. So it's worth it, just, you suffocate, but it'd be worth it just to have a go. Instead of looking at Saturn, we can also look at Jupiter. Now, Jupiter's moons are all actually proving to be very interesting in different ways. But the most prominent one that everyone looks at is Europa. And there are missions being put forward by NASA right now to go and visit Europa next. Now, Europa also has this thick, icy shell, and underneath, a salty ocean. This is just a cartoon effect image. We don't know if there are hot springs or hydrothermal vents on its base. But it makes sense, because that's what we find on the Earth. So Europa could be somewhere where we have an entire biosphere hidden underneath the ice. We just need to figure out a way to get there. We do know that there have been the odd jet of material seen to explode from the surface of Europa. So who knows what other secrets this little moon is hiding. But to live on any of these worlds, this isn't going to be the kind of life that's like us. We are weak, fragile, squishy things. We cannot survive pretty much anything. But there are many organisms that can. We call these the extremophiles, literally meaning extreme lovers. We find these all over the Earth. Oh, go back. I didn't press anything. It does that every time. We go through all the different environments on the Earth, and we can find these extremophiles hiding in some of the most dangerous and extreme ones. They're living in dry and wet, hot and cold, icy, salty areas, such as the hot springs around Yellowstone, acidic rivers at Rio Tinto, in Antarctica, and right beneath your feet, where there's no oxygen and no light, but life is thriving. And they're the kind of organisms that could survive on these different worlds. Now, as you got a pre-glimpse for, my favourite extremophile, that I, I think I go on about too much, but I'm going to do it again, is the water bear, or the tardigrade. And this is the kind of organism that could survive on any of the worlds in our solar system, as far as we're starting to understand it. It's actually an animal that's um, about the size of a full stop, if you uh, dot your page. Uh, this is a video taken just down a light microscope that we took the other day. Um, cute or not cute? Yes. I find it's like Marmite. Some people find it really disgusting and they don't really get it because you can see straight through. Um, so what you can see is you can see it's two little eyes and you can see all its little feeder tubes. All the green inside is all the algae that it's been chewing on and that's inside its stomach. And I'll tell you now because you're not going to see it because I cut it out. The one that's in the top corner is actually dead and this one carries on to go and eat it. <laughs> but I cut that out in case there were ch children <laughs> who didn't want to see it. So the water bear is an animal, and a very, very small one, but it is an absolute superhero. It can survive pretty much anything that's thrown at it. It's been boiled alive, it's been frozen, it's been deprived of oxygen, it's had toxic chemicals spilled over it. It's also been sent up to the International Space Station, put out into the vacuum of radiation of space, come back and carried on to have babies. But it hasn't done it looking like this, because looking like this, as the top picture shows, you can squish them and kill them quite easily. What it does is when it senses a dangerous environment or it loses water in its environment, it shrivels up into a ball. It pulls its eight clawed legs in, curls itself up and expels 97% of its body moisture. And basically it looks a little bit like a pollen grain. It's the mummified ingredients of life. And this pollen grain can stay like that at the moment, we're not even too sure how long, but maybe as long as it needs. Quite often, it, especially on the Earth, it'll get picked up in the wind and will get flown around and it will land. And if it lands somewhere with water or with a better environment, it will uncurl in a matter of minutes and crawl away and carry on living its life. 
If it doesn't land somewhere it wants to be, it just stays as a tonne. We found tonnes that are over 100 years old, um, but we, we don't know if we found any more yet. We also don't really know if they can ever die, because theoretically, if every time you hit a bad situation you could hibernate, then would you ever die? So we don't necessarily know. But that's why I think these little guys are so awesome. They are quite evolved to be this way. They're not quite as simple as bacteria. But they could survive on any of the worlds in our solar system, and maybe even beyond. So, Well, that would be definitely newsworthy if we found that on Mars, wouldn't it? So to try and understand where to look on all these worlds to potentially find tardigrades or to find any kind of other organisms, we need to study the only world we can really get to, and that's the Earth. And so my research does involve looking at analogues, yes. Analogues, everyone. <laughs> Haven't heard enough about analogues today, have we? So I study a number of different places that can mimic the different places that we find on Mars and some of the other worlds. So the first one I look at is modern and ancient rivers. Obviously, we find evidence of rivers and braided streams and deltas all over the surface of Mars. And so I study rivers on the Earth. I do appreciate there is water in these. Just go with me. This is Rio Tinto in southwestern Spain. It's a highly acidic river that's full of lots of um, acid-loving and acid-tolerant bacteria. Sometimes I get this right, sometimes I don't. Acidophyre bacillus ferrooxidans. <laughs> Such a tongue twister, but normally I get it right. So when we study the water at Rio Tinto, we find these organisms inside it. When we look back and we step back from the river, we find these river terraces. And these river terraces are over two million years old. When we break into these rocks, we find these black, I don't know, you can see, these sort of black wiggly patterns preserved inside them. And we can analyze them using lots of different techniques. And we can see that they are related as the great, 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 great times, however many ancestors of the organisms that are currently living in the water. And so basically, this is how we are trying to find life on Mars. We're finding a rock that's colonized with something. You can find the evidence of this colonization through holes, through mineralized and fossilized organisms, through gaps, through, through so, so many sort of textures that would imply to you there might be life in there. And then we analyze it using a range of tools and technologies, such as Raman or infrared spectroscopy. And when we do that, it will show that there's, in my case anyway, fatty acids proteins, DNA, sugars, all inside these rocks, which means we go from having an interesting rock with something wiggly in it to actually having evidence that this was once a living organism. So the idea is, could we go to these ancient rivers on Mars, break open the rocks, find something similar, and using these tools, identify those biosignatures? So I don't just look at ancient rivers, I also study hot springs and geysers. Thankfully the icy moons are proving to be really exciting in this sense, so they, we can find some good analogues for them. But also on Mars we found evidence of sort of silica deposits around the edges of volcanoes that we think might be hot spring deposits. And we go and study the hot springs on Earth. I work in New Zealand and in Iceland looking at these, and here I'm looking at organisms that are heat lovers and acid lovers. And they get trapped in all these rocks and minerals that you can see forming around all the water. When we look inside these rocks and minerals, we find basically evidence of fossilised organisms. This image on the left is one that was literally, take the rock out straight away, throw it in the SCM, what's in there? This one is a 400 million year, year old subaerial hot spring from the Rhiney Church in Scotland. The outlines here are ancient plant cells. The green is algae and the red are different types of bacteria and algae as well. When we look at this using spectroscopy, we can find fatty acids and proteins still preserved in these 400 million year old rocks. So why couldn't we do the same on another world? Volcanoes. We see volcanoes or at least the evidence of volcanoes on many of the worlds that we study. Thankfully, when we look to Earth, we have volcanoes as well that we can look at. This is an example of a volcano in Hawaii that I was studying. And if you're starting to see a trend, look inside the rocks of these volcanoes, especially the glasses, and we can find these filamentous bacteria. I say bacteria loosely, we haven't proven that. Filamentous organisms, let's say that. that they look very living, but then you look at spectroscopy and you can find fatty acids and proteins to prove that life did get trapped inside these lava flows. 
So, could we go up Olympus Mons on Mars, break open a rock, and maybe find something like this? The geology is very similar. I also work around impact craters. Now, impact cratering, we say, is a ubiquitous process in the solar system. We find evidence of these on every single planetary body that we look at. They've got a really bad reputation, thanks to the poor dinosaurs, but actually, impact craters create habitats. The sheer power of an asteroid or meteor hitting a solid planetary surface creates heat. It also fractures the rock, creating space. And this space and heat mean that water can circulate, forming a geothermal system. And suddenly you've got quite a nice little environment where life can worm its way in. And when we study many impact craters on the Earth, we find life currently living in the rocks or trapped inside minerals from when they were there before. And again, we can analyse them using the tools and technologies we put on the rovers and we can prove that there are biomolecules associated with them. Now, the final place I work at is frozen deserts, which, if many of the worlds are further away from the Goldilocks zone than the Earth, that's what you're going to be finding. Here are some from Mars. Here's one from Pluto. When they found organic carbon-based things on Pluto, that just that made my year. And even the surface of Europa. And we have frozen deserts on the Earth. Not as many as we could use, but the best one is the dry valleys of Antarctica, which is the most Mars-like place we have on the Earth. And when we look underneath the surface, not on the surface, life isn't living on the surface in the dry valleys of Antarctica. It's buried beneath the surface. We find the tardigrades, because they're awesome. We find nematode worms. We find cyanobacteria and loads of organisms living in cracks and crevices within the rocks where water can be liquid and isn't frozen, where they're protected from the extreme UV radiation that exists there. If that can be done on the Earth, there is no reason why it couldn't be found on Mars. And so that's what we're doing. We are exploring Mars and looking for signs or evidence of life. Now, Curiosity rover is the only one we can talk about right now, although I'm itching to talk about ExoMars when it eventually gets there. And Curiosity is not actually looking for life. It's just looking for a habitable environment. It's been up there since August 6, 2012. I remember when it landed, sitting in the Natural History Museum, watching, watching it land. Oh, that's exciting. Science, science porn, basically. And basically, Curiosity is an absolutely fascinating rover. It's basically got 10 scientific instruments on it. It's the size of a BMW Mini Cooper. It actually moves about the speed of a snail, which sounds really slow, but it's actually the fastest moving robot we've sent anywhere. One of its instruments fires lasers. So one of my colleagues once said it's kind of like a laser-firing nuclear-powered snail that we've sent to another world, which I quite like that idea, to be honest. It's also probably the most Twitter-savvy robot we have. It takes a lot of selfies. I checked yesterday, it's got 3.83 million followers, so probably more followers than all of us put together in Milton Keynes. And it tweets all the time, so it's definitely doing something right. Now, we've sent the Curiosity rover to Gale Crater, now, as I mentioned, impact craters before are very good places to find life on the Earth. And since they're found everywhere on every planetary body, it makes sense that we would go and study one when we went to Mars. So we chose Gale Crater, mainly because engineering constraints, obviously. It's also in the equator of the planet, so it makes it much easier for us to get access to it, to land it, and also for solar power, should it need it at any point. But we also sent it because from orbit, when we look at Gale Crater, we saw evidence that there had been liquid water there once upon a time. We saw evidence for potential rivers, potential lakes. We could also see mineral evidence of clays that implied to us that they can't form without water. So water had to have been there at some point. So you've got an impact crater that creates energy and evidence from orbit that there was once water there. So Curiosity's job was to get there and basically try and find carbon or find evidence of a habitable environment to prove us right, which it obviously did. Now, it sent back an amazing array of images, which we can all go through in detail if you want, but the most interesting are one of the first images that came back, which is in the middle, that proved that there were lakes, because this was the edge of a stream. We also drilled potentially one of the first deepest holes, and it was amazing how confused everyone was that all the powder that came up was grey, and not red. Scientists weren't. We were expecting grey rock, but 
the public. My goodness, it was amazing. It was absolutely, I think it opened everyone's eyes that the red planet is actually much more similar to Earth than we actually realise it is. We also did some surface drilling. And we also, very early in the mission, found this little thing here. Now, initially, everyone thought, oh, my goodness, it could be a bit of skin. It could be something that came off a dead animal. Oh, this is so exciting. And then it got analysed, and it turns out it's a bit of plastic. It's a bit of plastic that almost certainly fell off the rover or the landing stage when the rover arrived. So basically, we imaged the first littering on another world, which is awesome. And then my favourite factoid, which some people know, some people don't, is about the wheels of Curiosity. Now, as you can see, hopefully you can see, they've got little holes in them. This is because the rover drivers need to track the rover. So if they want help with driving, they can look back with the camera and they can see all the dots and they can figure out how far they've gone and where they've been. Or so they want you to believe. Actually, it spells out JPL in Morse code. So the reason for that is we're not really meant to put insignia on our rovers. We sort of do, but you're not meant to. It's a global effort. We're all doing this together. It's not one person. It's not one team. But JPL thought, but you know what? This is pretty good, and we've actually done a really good job. So they've spelt JPL in Morse code into the wheels. So naturally, all around Gale Crater, it now says JPL. So if any aliens can read Morse code, they're not going to know it came from Earth. It came from JPL. That's all that matters. I say that Curiosity fulfilled its goal, and it did. It found a carbon-based organic molecule called chlorobenzene. This means nothing to most of us, and it's not actually a, a molecule that we relate to life and that is necessarily important to life. What we actually think happened is that there were simpler organics, carbon-based molecules, and when these were heated up inside the SAM instrument of the rover, they mixed with the perchlorate in the soils of Mars and created the chlorobenzene. Either way, it still proves that there are carbon organic based molecules in the, su in the surface of Mars and they're surviving there. They're not being destroyed by the radiation. And that gives us really great hope that there are many more habitable, exciting environments on Mars. Now, we're not just focusing on Mars. We're actually not just focusing on our solar system. I'll briefly touch on our exoplanets because it isn't my field. I just find them really, really fascinating. So we have the Kepler Space Telescope, which has been one of the most exciting things that's been up searching for these exoplanets. It's finished its main mission. It's doing a few more bits of work. But my colleague sent me a picture the other day with two cups of water and said, this is how much fuel Kepler actually has left, which will last it about six months, apparently, to carry on doing and collecting science. But the data it's come back with we're going to be combing through forever. And so it's measuring the dimming of stars. And the stars it's looking at, there are over 150,000 stars that Kepler can see in its field of view. So basically, if you just held your hand up like that to the sky, that's basically the field of view of Kepler. So then you think about the whole sky, and we're really not even scratching the surface. But it's still 150,000 stars. So far, according to Google yesterday, 3,509 confirmed exoplanets have been found. I'm sure you're all feeling that every time you look at the news, quite recently there's a new exoplanet popping up all the time. Many inhabited, apparently. There are also 21 Earth-sized exoplanets that have been found in the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone of their stars. And that's, def that's a number that's going up pretty rapidly as well. Now, there are loads of different types of exoplanets. I think everyone's got their favourites. Everyone's got the ones they find most interesting. So I've just put up a selection of the ones that I think are most interesting. But ignore their names, because their names are rubbish. And there's no Tatooine popping up anywhere, is there? It's all Gliese. But we found a mini Neptune, but in the habitable zone of its star. And the thing is, if it's a red dwarf star, the habitable zone is very, very close to it. So that's a massive world to be very, very close to a star. Kepler 22b was one of the first um, planets to be found in the habitable zone around a sun-like star, which was exciting for us. And it's, it's a super Earth, it's bigger than Earth, but still getting closer than, say, Neptune. We have Kepler 186f. This was the first one that was found that was the, basically the same size as Earth in the habitable zone around its star. So that was a very exciting moment. But this is my favourite, Kepler 452b. Not really necessarily because it's an Earth 2.0. 
It has a very similar Earth-like year. It orbits around a sun-like star, and it's actually in the habitable zone of this sun-like star. But I think it's fascinating because it's one and a half billion years older than we are. So instead of finding an analogue for ourselves and trying to understand if there's another Earth out there, we potentially have seen a future Earth, an Earth 1.5 billion years ahead of us. If life arose there, what happened to it? Well, how is it doing? How's that world doing? It's giving us a glimpse potentially into our future. Obviously, we can't get to it yet. But theoretically, it's a very interesting world to look at. We've had two extremely famous exoplanet moments, the TRAPPIST system, which I'm not going to talk about necessarily, mainly because I recently met with the guy who found Proxima Centauri b, and he was so fascinating that I've just kind of taken this one and talk about this one now. So Proxima Centauri b is a roughly Earth-mass planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, our nearest star, and within its habitable zone, and it's only around 4.2 light years away. So in general, when everyone got really excited about this one, it wasn't really because of what it could do for us. It was more just because it was so close and within reach. And Stephen Hawking and his, um, what's it called? Light shot, tiny shot? Star shots, I knew I was going wrong. His star shot project theoretically could get there in 20 to 30 years. So that makes it a really, really appealing world. But we like to sort of, you know, be a bit pessimistic about ideas. So when everyone was getting excited about this, the planetary science community turned around and said, oh, well, hang on, let's just look at some of the issues with actually finding potential life on this world. It orbits around a red dwarf star. These are really, really dangerous active stars. They're very cold, but they have very violent outbursts. And because of them being very cold, any world to be in a habitable area and to be able to have water on it would have to be very close to that star. And being that close to a star that's violently erupting all the time is very, very dangerous in terms of radiation. Apparently, though, this star has quietened down, I got told, I got informed last week. So potentially it would be actually OK to be there. Any world that close to a star is going to be tidily locked. So one side is always going to face the star and one side is always going to face away. That isn't necessarily a deal breaker for life, but we don't have any examples of how that might necessarily work. There's actually a lot of research going into how it might work right now because we're quite fascinated with the potential of it. Everyone said that water could be stable on it. Well, theoretically, it's in the habitable zone, yes. But does water actually exist on it? We don't know. And, all, and that relies on this world having an atmosphere, which we haven't necessarily... Although apparently there's an embargoed bit of information that's coming out soon, but in the purposes of right now, we don't know if there's an atmosphere around this world. And we need there to be an atmosphere to protect this potential water, to allow it to be stable, to protect the world and any life on it as well. So I'll leave you with this slide, because I think it's probably one of the most important ones, to focus on all the missions that are actually happening right now that we can follow and pay attention to. I can't not mention Cassini, because in about two days, Cassini's going to die. It's on its final run. Um, so definitely keep following that on Twitter and online. It's going to be really, really sad, but actually brilliant because Cassini has done so much for us. But another mission that's actually ending this year is Dawn. Dawn is currently in the asteroid belt. It went to look at Vesta and did great work there. And it's now in the orbit around the dwarf planet Ceres. And on there has actually found carbon-based organ organic molecules as well. So the asteroid biologists were very excited about this. But they don't really know what to do with it. It might have a year's left of power. We're not too sure. And so they're trying to decide right now whether they're going to do a quick slingshot and send it to another asteroid or just let it die orbiting around Dawn and just forever become a new satellite of, of Dawn, of Ceres, a new satellite of Ceres. So at least we're not crashing into it, but we might just be creating a new planetary system. Very strange. Juno. Fantastic mission going around Jupiter, sending back some absolutely incredible images, one I have as the backdrop of my phone at the moment. We've got our Trace Gas Orbiter, which is currently doing good stuff, although no one's telling us anything about it yet, but they will do. Um, and then we've got to keep our eyes open for the ExoMars rovers from both us and the Europeans and the Russians, but also the Americans as well. And then finally, not to forget, New Horizons. So New Horizons went to Pluto, 
and just opened our eyes to this absolutely incredible world. But now it's even going further into the Kuiper Belt. So it's going to be incredible. And that's going to get there in 2019. So you only have to wait a year to find that out. And then finally, the Voyagers. Their 40 year anniversary is this year. They're still going and they're still sending back data. So it's really good to pay attention to all of that. So keep your eyes open on all these missions. I'm sure much exciting results are going to be coming out from them soon. And breathe. Done. <laughs> So we have time for questions. Be nice, all you academics. Do we have microphone runners? Uh, do we have microphone runners for this one? Alex, thank you. Peter, thank you. Hey, thank you, Louisa. Fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, in your a ancient stra strata, when you're, you're finding fatty acids mm -hmm. and you're finding am amino acids and proteins, what about the other great biopolymer, you know, nucleic acids. Are you finding any fragments, if any? Sometimes. It really depends. Um, and, and, and how old are the oldest? Uh, well, their age we can only date in relation to the rocks that they are in. So I found them in 400 million year old ones. We found them in two million year old gunflint chert. And I'm currently looking at stromatolites that are 3.5 million. I haven't found anything in them yet, though. But they, they do exist. Um, they survive as well as their preservation allows them to. Um, but yeah, yeah nuclei... They're chemically much less stable than the other yes, molecules. Yes, and especially at Rio Tinto, we find that the older rocks we look at, the less is preserved. The fatty acids seem to be the hardiest. They survive the longest. We find those in the oldest rocks. Um, nucleic acids, we do see them. There are two problems with it. First is they're very fragile, and they do break down very easily. The second is, um, when we use the spectroscopy method that I use, the minerals get in the way yeah. of where the nucleic acids are. We can subtract the mineral spectra out to try and see the nucleic acids, but it almost looks like we're introducing artifacts. It's, it's not a, a good result necessarily, and we don't like to sort of highlight it. But if you look at carbonates, for example, carbonates don't hit where the nucleic acids do. So quite often when I study caves and I'm looking at carbonates, suddenly I'm like, look at all my DNA, because I can see it then. Um, so that's basically it. They're probably there, they're just harder to find. Hi Lisa, super talk. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering, how do you know that um, Kepler 4-5-TB is one and a half billion years older than the Earth? Like, how have they managed to date it? They date it because the star itself, they know, is older. And so they just extrapolate that that's how old the planet is in relation to the star. Hi. Um, thanks for the lecture. Um, I'm very interested in your tardigrade pets there. Yay! Um, now, my interest in that is because you don't know how long that they can actually live because mm -hmm. we've not found that out. But... Um, how, from how much history do we know about their um, evolutionary history? Do you know of their, uh, th what their relation is or if there's anything else that you found in the fossil record? Not, not a huge amount. I haven't heard of people finding fossilised tardigrades anywhere, although one experiment we're thinking of doing is fossilising some um, to see what happens. Um, there is one idea that the, the, the way the tardigrades work and how they're able to be this extreme and to survive all these extreme environments is that when they're moving between their ton state and their real state, they're able to absorb DNA from other organisms around them. It was a bit of a controversial study, and I don't know if it was pro proven right or wrong, that they analysed some of the genome of the tardigrade, and they found bits from algae, bits from bacteria, there was something from a frog that all just sort of popped their way in. They think the tardigrades might be able to turn these on and off when they need to. Um, but again, we don't know. The tardigrade research is skyrocketing right now because there is so much interesting about them. They're so able to adapt, and they're so clever that it might be able to really help medicine, it might be able to help crop generation on Earth. And if you get space, it might just be really useful for us. But they're kind of a mystery at the moment. It's a PhD project. <laughs> Hi. Um, just to also try and answer that question. Oh, good, a little you know bit. the answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the University of Edinburgh, so not, not, not in the School of Physics, but um, over in biology, they have disproven that. So They did. I mean, tardigrades fascinating creatures they but have like they a small percentage of alien 
alien, don't take that literally, DNA, but not the massive amount that they came up with. Um, when we spoke to the guy recently, he seemed very dismissive of the whole thing, but of course he was the one who published the paper discrediting the whole thing, so he would be taking that stance. Fair. Um, David? Louisa, could you elaborate on your thinking about whether an atmosphere is necessary or not for life? You had it as one of your essential criteria when mm -hmm. you talked about icy moons. It seems to me a planet outside the habitable zone that had an ice-covered ocean could originate life and host life and even host tardigrades underneath it. I mean, so it, should an atmosphere be crossed out of a list of essentials or I think, not? Yeah, I probably should be more specific. I think an atmosphere is most important if you're having life on the surface. Um, if it's underneath ice, then ice is almost effectively doing the job of an atmosphere. But an, an atmosphere such as ours protects us from the radiation, it protects us from incoming projectiles, it equalises the pressure on the surface to allow liquid water to be stable, for life to be able to, at, at our stage, breathe, but it's not necessarily for that for simpler organisms earlier on in Earth's history. But I think if you're on the surface, you need protection from something. You need something to protect you from the radiations, and that's what an atmosphere is proving to be very good at. If they're under the surface, and I think we can maybe just wave at the atmosphere. As I say, it's not a huge criteria. It's one of those criteria that I think is very useful in many different ways, especially to help life evolve and to become multicellular. It's going to need that. But maybe right at the beginning, we can still just stick with our three basic carbon, water, energy. But again, it's very base, simple. Question. Any evidence that any of these exoplanets, especially the Earth-sized ones, have an accompanying large moon like we have? Because No one's found an exomoon yet. Right. Or a few people think they might have done, but again, it's all, everyone's still debating it. I think, it, I think an exomoon discovery is going to be, it's on the card, it's got to happen. John T's nodding. So a, lot of people, a lot of people think that's essential for multicellularity to evolve. They do. And highly intelligent or supposedly highly intelligent species like ourselves. Because we're the only example that they've got to use. Yeah, potentially, again, we, we know that the moon has a lot of brilliant effects for us and it helps stabilise our planet's axial tilt and it helps, gives us tides and it does a lot for us. Um, whether it's absolutely essential, we need to find another example to know that for sure. Alex, just down, uh, John T. Down Be nice, John T. <laughs> I will do. Um, given your comment on panspermia earlier... That, Sorry. Um, oh, no. It, it's fascinating. It leads to a lot of incredible debates over more or less amounts of alcohol. But where I'd like to go with that is if we find life on Mars, mm -hmm. and that is a big if, do you think it's more likely we'll find life that shares a common origin with Earth or life that will have a totally distinct and demonstrable separate origin? And what do you think the result of that would be going forward of actually having that knowledge either way? I th everyone's going, I can see all the academics looking at me waiting for this answer. Um, I think if we do find life on Mars, it's probably going to be indistinguishable from life on Earth. Why? I don't know. Is it because meteorites have been transferred between the worlds and therefore the molecules have? Is biology just universal, well, chemistry and biology just universal? There are a few ways that it could be different to prove to us that it has a different origin, such as chirality, but... If it doesn't, how are we ever going to know? How are we ever going to prove it? So I think we'll be excited enough that we found something on Mars. I think we can live with that, I think. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Louisa. Um, you've been Googling. Uh, look, you Googling? Is this, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> you look at your phone. I said you've Googled something. What have I said? No, no, no I haven't. Uh, what, what, what it is, actually, that you said at the, right at the beginning, you said this word, silicon. So c are you able to elaborate anything on it, please? Yes, it's, it's just... Um, because well, obviously when we're looking for life on other worlds, we, we look for carbon-based life because it's the only example that we have. And we have many reasons to show that carbon is a very, very good element to be used in life's processes and to build life itself. But there, we, we, we have to be open to looking at other options. Silicon is one of those options. It sits below carbon on the periodic table. It can form bonds. It can do lots of good things. Um, but we can always prove why it's not as good. For example, carbon bonds with oxygen and forms carbon dioxide, which is a gas which is very usable by different types of life. Silicon, if it bonds with oxygen, forms sand. And it's like forming double bonds. 
N not a bit. And, and when it forms the sand, it's, it's solid and it's hard and it's not usable by life in that way, um, just as an example. So there are other options, um, but it's hard to get funding when you can't prove why you need something. Carbon carbon's a safe bet for now. I mean, you know, the Earth is mainly silicon-based, but life still chose carbon. There's a reason for that. There's one another one from John C. So just following on from that one, um, what about the argument that if we're to find life beyond the solar system, it could well be second generation life, so in other words, silicon life that has been created by carbon life, because we're doing that already. We're populating the universe with our autonomous robot yeah. descendants that are clearly not carbon-based life. Yeah. So is that at all on the cards? Is that anything people are thinking of, or is it still too far enshrined in the world of sci-fi to be seriously know. considered? I have no idea. Makes sense to. I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that, if anyone does know the answer to that. I don't know. What do you think? You don't know either. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. Now, it's interesting to look for. No, absolutely. I think everyone's keeping their eyes open for mechanical beings as well as anything else. But, yeah. I don't know. Any, any other question? The bus is leaving in ten minutes. <laughs> uh, if there are no other questions... It's not a hand up. No, that was a head scratch. Sorry. <laughs> uh, if there are no other questions, then I'd like to take the time to thank Louisa again, please.